artist in this day and age, you've got a million people with their arms folded going, impress me, and dead end impress people. I was shocked at how it just kept building and building and building, you know, all the way to Howard Stern. It was on the cover of magazines. It, you know, it was one of the biggest fan films that's ever been made. I always thought that after Batman Dead End that Sandy was going to get a deal with Fox or Warner Brothers or Paramount, one of those big production companies. You're excited. You're like, OK, well, now it's going to happen. Sandy was poised. The rocket was ready to take off. And it was a very exciting time. My love of art started with comic books. Those were the first things I remember reading. You know, he would always be sketching in his books. Comics and superheroes were, were just such a big, big part of, you know, the gestalt of the Calora family. I mean, we had, you know, superhero stuff everywhere. All his comic books, he had them all in a row. He had them all uh, cataloged. He knew the stories. He knew the characters. I mean, he was really into it. My favorite title was Batman, uh, drawn by Neil Adams at that time. I'd say it was the mid-'70s. They were doing the Batman television show. So the television show wasn't exactly Batman and Robin. It was a satire on Batman and Robin. And the comic book company sort of couldn't help follow the television show because that was the moneymaker. The Batman and Robin that we grew up with had a very nasty Joker and had very nasty people, and Batman fought crime, and he was as smart as Sherlock Holmes, and he was athletic. He could win the Olympics if he wanted to. And so I went into my editor, uh, one of my editors, Julie Schwartz, probably one of the most recognized and best editors around. And I said to Julie, Julie, I'd like to draw Batman. How do you think you know what Batman should be and we don't know what Batman should be? Julie, Bobby, <laughs> it's not just me that knows what Batman should be. It's every kid in America knows what Batman should be. I'm just one of them. The only people that don't seem to know what Batman should be is people here at DC Comics. Come with me, you're drawing Batman. So I went with Julie, I was teamed up with Denny O'Neill, and we started turning out Batman stories. A little darker, a little more cape, a little spritz down the pants, we had Batman. Some of the other artists I like were John Byrne, uh, Jack Kirby was a big influence as well, but Neil Adams was my favorite. It all started with the Neil Adams Batman. Subsequent to that, I'd have to say one of the biggest influences in my Life artistically was heavy metal magazine. I loved heavy metal. Back in the 70s and the early 80s, that was just a, a plethora of incredible artists who all contributed different stories. So it was kind of like an anthology type of thing. And some of the artists that I was completely taken with were Mobius, uh, Richard Corbin, Philippe Julier, Inky Bilal, those European guys, I think, were doing a lot of things that most of the American guys weren't doing in comics. The work was a lot more avant-garde. It was a lot more, like, hand-painted as opposed to the way that stuff was being done here in the States. Um, not that it was any better or worse, it was just different. And then, of course, along came Star Wars. 
When my son saw that movie, that was the beginning. Then it came from doing art to actually having this mindset that he wanted to make movies. This is some of the most beautiful topography we have in the state. I mean, it's like a geologist's dream, archaeologist's dream. Look at this place. It's like Jurassic Park. Let's see if we can get a See if we can get a T-Rex. The first films I gravitated to were definitely the Spielberg movies. That's what first lit the fire was uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. And that's how he started to get into the creature design and making the sci-fi movies and this kind of thing. Because it's bigger than life. And who's bigger than life than Sandy? <laughs> and I remember the big question for my parents was, is Sandy going to pursue a life as an, as an artist, as a creative individual, or is he gonna go into more like marine biology or, or oceanography? And it was a big discussion in my house at that time. I was very stressed out about it, and uh, you know, my grandfather, he, he never said much, but he was a very perceptive guy, very smart guy, and he came up to me and he says, I tell you, the most, the best thing anybody could have be in the world is an artist because they make the world beautiful. That was it. Moving to LA from New York was a huge culture shock. Sandy moving to California was like setting a bomb off in the Kalora family. My mother became just obsessed with everything that Sandy was doing, how he was doing in school. There were tons of phone calls. We moved out here because Joanne was getting tired of getting on a plane every time she wanted to see her two sons. And so we bought this house and, you know, we're all set. You got a couple of bucks and now you're ready to enjoy the boys and let them be successful. And, you know, let's see how far they can go now, you know? I was going to Cal State Northridge. I was gonna go there for a year, establish residency, and then go to SC, film school. I first met Sandy uh, back in Cal State Northridge, and we were going to uh, industrial design class. I mean, at 17, he was easily five, six years ahead of everybody else in that class. I would see all of his industrial design drawings, and I was, I remember being like super impressed with just how modern everything looked compared to what he did before. It was very different. I mean, it seemed to me like he was really learning new stuff. Aliens, I think, was the first movie I saw in the theater when I moved to California. That's when I became familiar with James Cameron, who I think is our greatest living filmmaker. Aliens, Terminator, we would put all that stuff on and we would draw to those things for eight, nine, ten hours a day. He just studied what was in those movies, what made them fun, what made them interesting. The types of movies that Cameron makes, I think, are the best of both worlds. They, they encompass the eye and the artistic nuances of a Ridley Scott or a Stanley Kubrick film, yet he's made the top two grossing films of all time. Sure enough, after studying Predator and Terminator and Blade Runner and all these movies, you know, it only seems fitting that he's gonna end up at Stan Winston. Who's this guy over here? Sandy, he's one of the higher help. Can't, can't sculpt for a darn, but he sure can pass football. I remember looking at Sandy's artwork and thinking, wow, this is really clean work. I mean, I could tell it already had a level of polish that most other people hadn't had at that point. And he had his portfolio and he's sitting there. And it's like he has come to the place that he has dreamed of his entire life. I mean, his eyes are like saucers. He's looking around, he's really excited. Stan Winston's in the late 80s was a pretty magical place to me. I just remember there being so many talented people there, like I just never wanted to go home. He was uh, a, an equal balance of just complete self-confidence in himself with being like thunderstruck and in awe. Is that insane or will? I mean, are we, are we magicians of special effects here? Or, or no, you're just trying to pay your way through college. I'm a magician of special effects. <laughs> there you go.
But the balance would do this. You know, sometimes the confidence would get a little much, and sometimes the wonder would get a little much. I mean, he asked a million friggin' questions. They kind of glommed on to my, my enthusiasm about Cameron, and they loved telling me stories about him on Terminator and Aliens, about how he would storyboard sequences himself and operate the camera, and it just... I, I just became infatuated with that type of director and that type of filmmaking. Because, you know, Jim was not just a great filmmaker, Jim is also a really great illustrator and artist and, and conceptual artist himself. I remember seeing drawings up at Stan's studio that James Cameron had done for Terminator and for Aliens, and just, I couldn't take my eyes off them. There was like a pencil sketch of um, when Lance Henriksen was going to play the Terminator. There was a really cool pencil sketch of, you know, Lance's face gone and there was, you know, the inner workings of the endoskeleton. And we'd say, hey, Sandy, we need you to seam this, you know, seam this glove. And we'd come back and the glove would be sitting there and Sandy would be looking at a drawing. And before you could say anything, he'd turn to you and start asking questions. And you go, Sandy, 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 focus, please. But I get it. It's just like movie magic in the back, you know, lot of their little studio. And Sandy's, Sandy's part of this world. And I'm thinking, my goodness, this, this is where Sandy's going to be. He got in, and I don't think he's ever going to let go. Getting the job at Stan Winston's changed everything. I just loved it there, and I wanted to spend more time there. And eventually, I wound up leaving school and, and working at Stan's full time. There were so many people there that were far more advanced than I was. And even at that young age, I knew that like, that's where you want to be. You know, you want to be around people that are better than you, so you learn more. Now, mind you, for the record, I wasn't doing a whole hell of a lot of creative things there. Which we all did. I mean, we all started out at the bottom, you know, you're seeming things, you're casting things. And you could see in his eyes that he was very frustrated. I was making a lot of noise there about wanting to sculpt and paint and, and draw and do more of the creative stuff. Essentially, that's probably why he was eventually let uh, go from, from Stan Winston's. Getting let go from Stan Winston's was a bummer. Unfortunately, I mean, I was really young and I was very inexperienced in the ways of a creature shop works, that there's people there that are, that are senior to you, that have been there longer, and it's kind of, there's kind of like a pecking order there, you know? And it just, just didn't work out. That whole experience at Stan Winston's was part of the foundation that, that taught Sandy how to proceed with his career. Obviously, Sandy was made for, for bigger things. I went and wound up uh, at Landmark Entertainment actually working for Gary Goddard and Tony Christopher where I had the opportunity to design and sculpt. Sandy was not like the other Kaiser, you know, he was extremely loud, very opinionated, very strong-willed, um, and, you know, initially I thought pretty obnoxious, you know. And one of the other sculptors was showing me his portfolio and there were pictures of Robocop in there. I said, you know Henry Alvarez? Henry has always been nothing but just a humble, gracious, nice guy. You know, he's so talented. He's done some amazing, iconic work for the film industry. Um, and just no ego about it whatsoever. I called Henry up, and it was a couple of months went by before he actually, I wore him down and just, yeah, OK, come to the studio. Come, come. In the beginning, he had a lot of uh, talent. Uh, he was an exceptional two-dimensional artist, wanted to be a sculptor. Uh, at first, I didn't think he really had what it took. I first met Sandy down at uh, Henry Alvarez's shop. Sandy was very sure of himself, um, a little on the cocky side, but a really nice guy. You know, he and I hit it off instantly. After a little while, um, Henry took me under his wing and started to train me. He stayed with it. He became an exceptional sculptor. Henry Alvarez was one of a kind. He taught us how to read a photograph and the lights and the shadows and the forms and, and all that. His eye was just incredible. The word brilliant, I, in my opinion, is quite overused, especially in this industry, but Henry Alvarez was brilliant. He sculpted darkness, RoboCop, all this great Rob Bottin stuff. He worked on The Thing. What I learned from that man is unparalleled. 
it simply cannot be measured. I mean, I'd watch that guy rough stuff out in an hour. You know, we're talking about fishing and we're talking about he's just like, You know, and then two seconds later, you look over, it's like, oh my God, that's Tom Cruise. <laughs> you know, I've, I've never seen anybody do that before or since. It's magical, magical man. Henry was like a second dad to, to Sandy. I think that connection was so strong because he saw in me what, what others didn't have the, the foresight or the patience to see. He saw the human being that was hiding under the arrogance and, and the, the confidence and, and uh, not a lot of people did that, especially when I was that young. Not only was he teaching Sandy the artistic side of things, he was also teaching Sandy how to be a better human being. <sighs> I mean, I, I miss the guy. It's, it's, it's tough talking about him because he's, he's, he's gone. Um, Sorry. Look how beautiful she is. Look at her. Big models. Hey, buddy. Another day at the office. The 90s were a very interesting decade for me. Um, I worked on some pretty high profile films. Uh, I got to work on Jurassic Park. And I actually got to meet and work directly with Steven Spielberg on that project. I remember going in and bringing drawings and paintings and stuff that he was looking at and making notes on and stuff, so that was cool. I worked on Men in Black in 95 with Rick Baker. I'll never forget this. Uh, Rick Baker called me personally and he brings me into this conference room and who's in there? Steve Wang, Jordu Shell. Moto Hada, Carlos Wante, Jose Fernandez. These are the best designers in the business. The best creature guys in the world. And to be asked to be a part of that really made me feel that I'd arrived and, 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 was, and was pretty cool. I also did a lot of toy development work. I started a small company designing and sculpting action figures for companies like McFarlane Toys, Mezco, Toy Biz. I did a lot of the Marvel stuff. I had a big contract with Lucasfilm. Sandy was really into the dramatic poses and muscular superheroes, and that was a new thing on the scene. You know, it's basically right out of the comic books into an action figure. Uh, a lot of superhero stuff, concept art and maquettes for video games. We did a bunch of huge statues that were going to the different offices and whatnot, and that was a blast. He was doing these toy prototypes for tens of thousands of dollars. Somewhere along the line, he decided, I, I don't care about all that. I want to make movies. That's really what I want. You know, I could have all this money and a house and all this stuff, but that's not really what it is for me. And that impressed me. Out of all the projects I've ever worked on, all the movies I ever worked on as a sculptor, a designer, or an effects guy, my favorite by far was The Abyss. Jim Cameron's my hero. I, I want to be like the guy, you know? I, I aspire to be like him. The way that he saw uh, Cameron talking to people and, and controlling the set, I think really just kind of galvanized Sandy and made him think, like, God, you know, this is how a director should be. And, you know, you've got to be in charge. You've got to know exactly what you're doing, exactly what you want. That's probably the main, main turning point for him and, and may have been one of the major things that made him want to direct is just, just being on that set and seeing Cameron do his thing. And to get there, he started to learn how to make the pieces that go into the movie. And then getting on the other side of the camera, you know, how to make those things look the best. So I went and spent a lot of the money that I had made in the toy industry building a spec commercial reel. And I got signed with Level 7 Productions as a commercial director and I started working right away.
I had visited Sandy at Al7 and he had shown me this incredible commercial he had made for a, a, like a Japanese sports drink or something. It was a soccer game underwater and I was thinking, holy crap, how did he do this? You know, it was amazing. It's still an amazing commercial. I was directing commercials, and at the same time, I was trying to get my first feature film off the ground. And I remember sitting down with Chris Van Houten at Level 7, and I was frustrated. It's like, you know, why does anybody want to look at my reel? Why how come I'm not getting it? And he's like, dude, if you want to get the attention of the Hollywood boys, he said, you have to do something outside of commercials. You know, you have to do something that's a little longer, that encompasses a little more, that's maybe a little bit more cinematic. And he said, you, you know, you should think about that. He says, I think you've got the talent to do it. What Sandy is looking for is something to catapult him where he should be, which is directing feature films. He had the ability, he, he needed the shot to show that he could do it. So I thought to myself, you know, I'd always wanted to see the Batman that I loved, the Batman that I grew up with, you know, the Neil Adams Batman. I wanted to see that come to life on 35 millimeter film. And I thought, while we're at it, why don't we incorporate some other things into this film? Instead of him fighting the Joker solely, let's have him fight the Predator. Predator is my favorite film monster of all time. Hell, let's throw an alien in there. Let's just make a big mashup of, of all this stuff. When he told me what he wanted to do with Batman Dead End, um, I kind of told him he was crazy. <laughs> I actually warned him. I just said, you know, why would you want to waste your money and do something like that? You know, do do something original. Do you know whatever? But um, there was no telling Sandy what what to do. He's a huge fan of Batman, huge fan of Predator, you know, huge fan of Alien, and I think it was inevitable that he was going to make this movie. Myself and a guy named Mike Hernandez. Uh, old college buddy uh, storyboarded the movie. He tells me what he wants, he gives me the script, we go through it, and we would just be throwing these drawings back and forth. So somewhere in between the burgers and the fries and the late night, we're, we're banging out these boards. And I took the script into Chris Van Houten with some storyboards, and he looked at me and he smiled. He says, ah, he says, this is a little bit more ambitious than I was talking about. He says, but I think this is the right idea, kid. I remember I told Shannon Shea, I said, I, I want to spend $35,000. And he says, you know, is level, seven, is level 7 paying for this? And I said, no, I'm paying for it myself. He said, wow, why? And he said, let me ask you a question. How much money would you invest in yourself if you knew it was going to lead you to a directing career? You know, some people invest in stocks, bonds, T-bills. Some people invest in real estate. I invest in myself because I know that's a worthwhile investment. My parents were a tougher nut to crack on Batman Dead End because unfortunately, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. That also meant that my parents didn't have the time or the wherewithal to be as supportive of that as they had been my other things. And I knew that going into it, and, and, and I knew that was gonna make it all that much more difficult. And thus it began. So the dumpster basically sits right in the middle. Simon Tams and Darren Hicks wanted to produce this movie for me. And I think their support of it early on was key. And they said that they knew some people that had worked on the previous Batman films that could really help out. Simon knew that I'd worked on uh, some Warner Brothers Batman features, Batman Returns, Batman Forever. I worked on Batman and Robin and knew I was a big Batman fan and thought that uh, I'd be the guy to help Sandy realize this costume and make his vision come true. I met Sandy uh, late 2001. He was doing a project called Archangel where he needed a, a, a pair of angel wings, animatronic angel wings. told me I want to have 
first it was Predator and Batman, which I said, mm, all right, maybe. But he wanted Alien, Predator and Joker. I mean, it, it was so much to do. I said, this is not gonna happen. Like real slow. Oh, that's it right there. Greg Ramundos, who was one of the effects artists on Batman Dead End, was a friend of mine. And he had mentioned that Sandy was doing a short film about Batman. I'm a huge uh, comic book fan and a Batman fan, so I wanted to be part of this thing. Immediately, I saw the potential of playing with these characters, like Batman, Predator, Alien. And as a stunt coordinator, it, it, it got my creative juices flowing because I wanted to see what I can do with these three characters. Slice it his groin, slice it his chest. Over, over, straight. straight. Scott Rhodes, I'm really gung-ho, really excited for the project. And when he approached me, there were some intricate and difficult shots he wasn't specifically sure on, which was my forte, where he said this alien is going to come down and grab somebody and pull them up. And of course, right away, I get excited going, okay, this is cool. This is something I want to do. Not even about the Batman, just this was a cool stunt. And then the fact that there was a superhero film on top of it, I thought, okay, this is doubly cool. I'm crazy and you know, you just have to find the right crazy people. And wow, there was one out there. His name was Sandy Calora. And it was just, it was so cool and challenging. And, and he had it completely boarded. So it wasn't gonna be grab the shot and go. Every shot is, has gotta be perfect. Greg Ramundas, who was the mechanical designer, called me saying, this guy Sandy Calora has got this project and there's this a creature or two I think you could play. And seeing all the storyboards and everything laid out professionally, just knowing that it was gonna be shot, you know, at in the dark, in the rain, I realized, oh, there's a production value here that's gonna look really nice. I thought, well, okay, not only will I help play a predator, let me help make predators. Batman Dead End was, was a perfect storm of sorts. Nick Alvarez and myself were sculpting the Predator suit at Henry's shop. Nick and I had a ball sculpting that Predator suit. Man, that was fun. I was painting everything, making Predator helmets, making Predator dreads, all the weapons, all the mechanical stuff. Everything else effects-wise was being made at Greg Ramundos' shop in the valley. Sandy and Nick Alvarez uh, invited me over one night to go look at the sculpture, and we spoke at length about the paint job, and I kind of explained to him how I painted the original Predator. The paint job was based out with orange and flesh colors, and then the blacks and the browns and everything else was introduced into the paint job to bring it into what it was. Sandy was very meticulous about what he wanted this Predator to be. He really wanted these Predators to be accurate to what the, the, the movie versions were, and as well as creating his own Predators as well, since that whole world is so open to interpretation and, and introduction of, of new concepts and ideas. Every quill that I put in the Predator's head, every dot that I paint on that Predator's skin, I'm thinking, how's that gonna look on film? How's that gonna look when it's lit right with the smoke and the rain? It's such a buildup. We were making a Batman movie. We were making Predator suits. It was like a dream come true. So I'm waking up at five o'clock in the morning to go to either Henry's or Greg's and work. 12, 15 hours. Okay, if you're stalking me, turn, turn, turn. And then at nine or 10 o'clock at night, I would drive all the way back to Orange County to Hogue Hospital to see my mom. By the time we rolled into pre-production on Batman Dead End, she was already going through chemo. It was a living nightmare for her and for the family. I lived for six months on four hours of sleep a night. And that's no lie, that's no joke. And it was fucking hard, dude. You didn't think oh, all that stuff was going through my head about my mom's dying and I'm making a fucking Batman movie? I mean, all, every day, every day, but my mom was always there. No, no, go, go to work. As you're standing up, spread them. There you go. You know, not, not out like this, the shoulders. Okay. I knew to achieve this project, the biggest key to getting this to work was getting the right Batman. Clark Bartram was not my first choice to play Batman. Originally, Sylvester Stallone was supposed to play Batman. 
in Batman Dead End. Yeah, that's cool. It's hot. My lawyer at the time, uh, a wonderful woman by the name of Lee Burkeen, she says, well, you know, John, her husband, he plays golf with Sylvester Stallone. Why don't you go talk to him? I remember looking, I mean, I'm a huge Rocky fan. Huge. Like Stallone, like grew up with that, right? She goes, bring up, you know, your sculptures and your artwork and stuff and talk to Sly. Here's his number. I went home that night. And I called, uh, hello? I said, Mr. Stallone. He goes, you call me Sly. I said, okay, Sly. Uh, my name is Sandy Calora. I'm a friend of Libra Keens, and I've got some... Some projects. Oh, yeah, sure. Listen, you come up, uh, you know, on Tuesday or whatever, whatever. Mind you, this is before Rocky Balboa, before John Rambo. He was in that kind of funk before he kind of reemerged, you know, like the Phoenix he so wonderfully did. That was the only reason why somebody like that would take a meeting with somebody like me. Come up, knock on the door. And there, standing in the doorway, is Sylvester Stallone. And he looked phenomenal. I couldn't believe how good he looked. He was all yoked and just looked great. He invited me and he said, hey, how you doing? Come on in. Oh, would you, you got visual aids here. And, and he took one of the sculptures and we walk in his living room. And he's like, so, uh, you know, Lee Burkeen tells me you direct a lot of commercials and stuff like that. What are you working on now? <clears throat> I said, well, oddly enough, I said, it's, uh, it's, it's a little Batman movie I'm putting together. And he put his drink down and he goes, Batman? Really? Stallone was a big Batman fan and, you know, he said he wanted to be a bat, you know, play Batman. Uh, how sure are you that, you know, the studios aren't going to come after you? I said, well, I, to be honest with you, Slide, I'm winging it. I, I, I don't know. And there's just a long pause and he just goes, all right, I'm in. And I'm thinking in my mind, he's gonna give me the money or somehow he, uh, it, at that moment, I didn't know what he meant, but what he was telling me is that he, was, he wanted to play Batman. I explained to him how we were gonna do the cowl. I said, what I'm gonna have to do is life cast you and, and we'll sculpt it over the life cast. And, I, and I, re I remember clear as day telling him, Sly, I, remember this is only gonna work if we do this kind of under the radar. I don't really recommend getting your manager and your agent like involved. Oh, no, 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 this is, you know, we're just gonna do it, you know, guerrilla style, skeleton crew. That's how we did Rocky. In typical producer fashion, I remember telling Simon that we got Sylvester Stallone. And he goes, you know, now that we've got Stallone, you can get whoever you want to play the Joker. My favorite Joker that's ever been done is the animated series. And Mark Hamill does the voice on the animated series. He's like pretty much the definitive Joker. I mean, he would make a great Joker. So now here I am in the same week, I've just been up at Sylvester Stallone's house. Now I'm talking to Luke Skywalker, who is saying to me, Sylvester Stallone is it? I'll do it. The end of the week rolls around, we got Alginate, we got director's chairs, you know, plaster bandage, everything we need to do the life cast. Now I'm 10 minutes from his house, my cell phone rings. He goes, hey, yo, it's Sly. I said, hey, Sly, what's up? We're almost there. He goes, uh, look, I got some bad news, kid. He says, I, I you know, I, I can't do it. There was some problems with some of his publicity people, his agents, they, because we were dealing with uh, different copyrighted material and it, it involved stepping on a lot of people's toes. I remember, like, yelling at him like on the phone, like, Sly, I, we talked about this, I told you, you. I know, I know, but you gotta understand, you know, I, I, it's different for me, I got more to lose than you and all that, and eventually I understood and we amicably, you know, parted ways and whatever, and then of course, as soon as Stallone went away, Mark Hamill pulled out. Now that would have been really something, but it didn't come, it, didn't, it never came into flourishing. The person that eventually was gonna wind up playing Batman along with myself, was basically gonna be carrying this movie on his shoulders. Sandy was looking for bodybuilders, guys that didn't need to be in you know, a plastic suit with fake nipples and all that to play Batman. He was obviously looking for not only a guy with a physique, but a guy who could move. So I drove all the way up to Level 7 Studios, met Sandy, and I read the part. And I can remember there was one part when I read, I grabbed Sandy and I pushed him against the wall. 
and I read one of the lines, and he looked at me with this fear in his eye. We all wear masks. That was Batman. That was Batman. And I walked off and went home and got the call, and you know, the rest is history. Clark was not the Batman fan he is now back in 2002, 2003, when I hired him for that movie. If I'm being honest, I never really watched Batman, other than the campy you know, TV series. And he's like, listen, that's not the guy. He sent me a DVD of the animated series. And he said, I want you to study this voice. Incredible scum like you made me. That was the first step in the process, is really grabbing a hold of what the character was meant to be like, and for Sandy's vision. Clark was relying very heavily on guys like me and Mike Mack to, to talk him through about why certain things on the costume were achieved a certain way, how they were going to look on film, how it was going to translate all into the language of film to get the best performance out of him. Clark was a Marine. I mean, he's, he's not just a pretty boy who goes to the gym all the time. He's a guy that lived the life, walked the walk, and then put his body into this, this high level of professionalism. So you give him a blade, you give him a leap, you give him, I mean, he's, he's a stunt man, really. He wanted a lot of movement out of him. He wanted to be able to turn his head, things that had not necessarily been able to be done with the, uh, the feature versions. All the cows before that, going back to the Tim Burton, you know, uh, yeah, there was no movement in the head. They needed to look at the comic book, and that's the thing that they didn't weren't looking at. The ears are going to dictate a lot of like how aggressive it looks, you know. The decision to sculpt the uh, cowling was basically a favor to Sandy because I had been mentoring him since he was 19 years old, and uh, he had come to know my style of sculpting and wanted to use that factor on the uh, the look of the new cowling. The ears should curve in just the slightest bit. They shouldn't go straight up or see, you, and like on both sculpts, like I noticed, there, there's a tendency for them to flare out a little bit. That I think is weak. Strong is the, is the, is, is curved in at the top. Of course he would sculpt the cowl, right? Who else would do it, right? He did a beautiful job on that. It, it, it had a really cool look to it that I'd never seen before in a back cowl. There was something really organic but that felt like his face, but it was also a mask. So I thought that was a really cool, interesting approach. You know, I built up here to make his jaw a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of playing in to make this... Uh, Thinner, so you get the, the movement. Yeah, and also to, to create a shadow there, so it even looks, from the side, looks mm -hmm. deeper. Yeah, stronger. The main thing that stood out to me was the look. It, was, uh, it wasn't a helmet, it was or an organic face. It's really the only expressive cowl where it looked almost uh, like he could, if he, if he crinkled his face, it moved with him. The cowl was cool, the cape was cool. The belt was awesome, the boots were awesome. Everybody has to make compromises. I think this was an experiment in not making compromises. And it worked. Um, we also had Andrew as the Joker. Look at me, this is who I am. My mask is permanent. You have a choice. My contribution to that was Joker's makeup. Sandy said he wanted a nose and a chin, and I was able to talk him into doing a little thin little brow piece. I get that man. Oh, I'll get him. Mark my words. We have a play date. <laughs> it was very comic bookish. I suppose that was the thing that I liked the most. Very creepy with the long chin and the sort of hook nose and the pasty white face and the stringy green hair. Uh, and having him in a straight jacket, you know, certainly, certainly helped. That Joker influenced the movie Joker. I think that that maniacal, berserk quality was right there. <laughs> I can imagine the actor watching that over and over again. That's it. Mm. Cameron loves me. Give me the tea. Yeah. It was just really neat getting to work with real actors, guys that do this for a living, and guys that are stuntmen. And when I got to meet the stuntman and start doing that, that's what really was fun to me. Getting out there and fighting people and, and just playing in the streets like a little kid. 
it wasn't so much that Sandy handed me a finished script of the fight scene. In, in a lot of ways, it was like Ben-Hur. You have this epic script, and in the middle of it, it says, chariot race. Now, that's 11 minutes of screen time and like months of somebody's life. And as the stunt coordinator, it was up to me to, to come up with the concept and make that happen for him. So what we did was we sat down over lunch and we just brainstormed a bunch of ideas. What would you like to see in a Batman Predator fight? What would I like to see? I knew there was one thing that was going to cause a little bit of controversy, but I liked the idea of... Batman versus Predator in an alley at night in the rain, very guttural, very visceral, and he pulls up a lead pipe and starts whacking Predator with him. I knew that was going to split the fans kind of down the middle. The, the irony of Bruce Wayne and Batman at the height of technology with everything this guy has at his disposal, when it trips it down, he's slammed into the wall, his first instinct is to pick up a lead pipe and start swinging it, the, the lowest tech thing you can have. And that's, that's one of my favorite parts of, of what I brought to the fight. Stepping into the shoes of the Predator after Kevin Peter Hall, I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to half-ass this. To the production's credit, they had Clark and I so well rehearsed in that fight, uh, we could have done it blind. <sighs> Around March or April, I get the news that my mom is terminal. So I remember going to the hospital. Uh, I was there with her alone. And I said, look, we don't know how much time you have. And my mom looks at me and she goes, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll put the shoot off. And she leaned forward out of the bed and she says, do not do that. If you quit this movie, I'll kill you. So I'll take you with me. You're not quitting this movie. It just goes to show like the kind of woman she was, you know? And, and I remember after that, I, I did cut the workload back. We did push the shoot. Not a lot, but enough for me to spend just more than a few hours every night with her, which I thought was a good thing because it was a little bit of the, the balance of both. The work that we put in in pre-production benefited all of us on set because it went pretty smooth. The shoot was probably still, till this day, the best four days of my life. We get to the set and it's just like, wow, this is so cool. The set was phenomenal. I mean, the way they built this little alley was, was amazing to me. And I was in there practicing and then I show up to shoot and I see this thing transformed into like a movie set. And I'm like, oh man, this is, this is real right now. I'm on the real deal. There were so many other layers that were impending in because you were really creating this world. And Sandy had done s such a ridiculously cool job of just art directing his own stuff. So he, everywhere you looked was his visual. We got the E-fans going and we got smoke rising. And you build not only the tone of the piece, you build the tone of the shoot. It was just this exciting to see everybody dressed up as you know predators walking around and heads and pieces of armor and there's all this activity with people doing, you know, script revision or, you know, talking about the scenes. You know, there's Henry Alvarez is there and then Steve Wang showed up on the set and everyone wants to see this type of thing kind of go off and, you know, there's Sandy over there. And sometimes you're like, I gotta pull this off. We started on a, was a Thursday night and it was supposed to be a walkthrough and uh, it was a shoot through. I remember Sandy saying, listen, dude, when you put that cowl on, you're not Clark Bartram anymore. You're Batman. Do you understand? And I'm like, yeah, I understand. So Mac is suiting me up. I'm thinking to myself, I have to transform myself into this character that I've learned about over the last few months. So Mac puts the cowl on me. 
I got up and I walked over and I just felt like I became Batman. I really did. And I'll never forget, and I don't think Sandy will either. I'll never forget this. The first day of shooting, out walks Clark in full costume for the first time. And I froze and I just looked at him. He walked up to me to give me some direction. He's like, okay, here's what I need you to do. You know what's up first, right? We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, whatever. And he just looked at me like this. He looked at me with that scared look again, like the day when I auditioned and I slammed him against the wall. And I just walked off. I didn't say a word. <laughs> and I remember looking at Anita, his wife. And he said, what's wrong with Clark? She says, what happened? I said, I'm just, I'm talking to him. And he just kind of didn't acknowledge me. He just walked off. And she said, that's not Clark. That's Batman. And I, I remember, I'm smiling now, just like I was then. It was like, yes, like, he's there. So from that point for me, it was on. When he walked out in that outfit, that was just like the punctuation to, as an AD, everything coming together. <laughs> Henry Alvarez, I think, said it the best. Seeing him on camera and the fierceness, the, the expression that he applied to Batman, his body, the way he moved, it was like he totally became Batman. What do you think about all this, Henry? Oh, man, it's looking cool. There he was in the flesh, standing right next to you, a life-size action figure that encompassed all of the best elements from Neil Adams, Alex Ross, Simon Bisley, Brian Boland, M Mike Mignola, all, all the great artists that had drawn Batman. I think all of it was there, and Clark embodied all of that. Criminal scum like you made me. I think Clark Bartram was probably the best Batman I have ever seen on film. He had the look, he had the intensity, he knew how to do the action, he was never doubled. The part was extremely physical. I mean, you couldn't get a more physical part, I don't think. And he's throwing himself down in the puddles and he's getting all banged up, slamming into the wall. That's what Batman should be, in my humble opinion. When I read the comics when I was a kid, I didn't know it at the time, but what I was seeing in my head was Clark Bartram. I wanted to fight him. I wanted to fight him, that's all. I, I saw that guy want, he'd probably kill me, but I want to fight that guy. Tough, tough guy. If that guy's got a bigger uh, uh, upper arm than I have, I respect that. People got the chills. See, just in the shop, like him just walking by with the cape kind of falling behind him and just that gait, that swag we had. You know, like it's, that's, Batman just walked by here. That is the Dark Knight. We had the same aspect when we were working on Superman back in 1970. And Chris Reed walks on the set and they wrap that cape under him and he's, it's Superman right out of the comic books. And that's amazing. And that's what Clark portrayed. And then Clark, give me your, uh, uh, the curtain. Hit him and Clark, I want to see you. I like to have things very prepared when we get on set because I want to be able to capitalize on those kismet moments, those happy accidents, or those great things that you see when you, you know you look at your AD and go, "Hey, look, you know, I know we're supposed to go here after this shot, but I really like the way that the steam is coming out, or whatever." Yeah, you gotta come see this. You get caught up in the energy of someone who's so focused, and he's gonna be going, ooh, I love the way that the that the Batman cape hit in the water. Everybody, get in there, get in there. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. That's oh, that is just <laughs> sickening good. Yeah, Robert. The famous or infamous shot of Batman leaping off the roof, hitting the ground and the puddle, slowly standing up with the cape slowly rising behind him was like one of the most iconic shots in the entire short. I, I look at it like, Bernie Wrightson's Batman, the gothic Batman. Bernie always made the cape flare and bigger than it was, and that one shot was exactly like a Bernie Wrightson drawing, where it comes up and the cape is amazing. Like, thank God it's MOS, because everyone's just 
Oh, holy shit, I got it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People think it's an effect shot. They actually think that it's CG coming up. And that's just the juncture of preparation. I mean, it's the old luck thing. It's the juncture of uh, you know preparation and opportunity. Can you tell the camera what you think without taking well, your pants off? Let, let's, put it, <laughs> let's put it this way. This shot will be in the film. I mean, that doesn't come from a filmmaker who doesn't understand cinematic shots. That comes from a person who really gets it. Whenever you do a superhero movie, the fans are always going to be divided. They're going to be split down the middle because they all have preconceived notions of what Batman or any superhero looks like and how they act. But unanimously with this short film, everybody digs that shot. It was just me, Vince, and Nick focused. Like, we're going here, we're going there, we're going there, we're going to turn around. All the while, Clark soaking wet. Cast and crew soaking wet. It was all night shoots, and we shot all night. Action! It was always raining, and it was always raining. Cue the rain, cue the smoke, you know, and everybody's like, oh, we're missing, you know, it's like it's a rain freaking shoot. We had the sequence where the Joker's against the wall laughing maniacally, and the alien comes down, grabs him, and drags him out of the shot. <laughs> And this was cool because it hadn't been done before, and I used a ratchet that had a reversed ratchet that brought the one figure down, grabs the Joker, and pulls them both out of the same shot. And it's never been done at this time. I, I kind of have this saying that we make the impossible possible and the incredible by appointment only. So this was kind of an appointment only thing because we were going to make something really incredible. You're going back to art. <laughs> A superhero movie has to be kind of handled with kid gloves. It has to have the right director. It can't be just a good director. It can't even just be a great director. It's got to be a director that knows the genre. And you have to be a comic book fan. If you're not, it's not going to come off. It's not going to work. When Sandy gets a take that he likes and you hear cut, you usually hear a cackle or a loud scream or some kind of like boisterous response. That's Sandy, and you know that he likes the take. Criminal scum like you made me. Jesus Christ Almighty! The director says action, and I walk up, and I plant my feet, and I bring up my fist, and I look at it, and I look at Batman, and I punch. And then the director says, Kurt, that's the greatest thing you will ever do in your life. You know, we're looking at playback, just going like, oh my God, this is, this is gonna work. This is going to work. I recall everybody just kicking ass. And that's the kind of shoot you come to LA to do. That's the kind of shoot you come to Hollywood to be a part of. Um, Batman Dead End was that shoot. It was, it was the Hollywood dream. We lived it. I think I caught a really bad cold too. Maybe bronchitis. San Diego Comic-Con 2003, Batman Dead End was going to premiere there as part of the Comic-Con Film Festival. San Diego Comic-Con is the mecca for any comic book fan or anybody who's interested in anything in the genre. I mean, once in your life, you have to go to San Diego Comic-Con. Sandy goes, you ever been to a Comic-Con before? And I'm like, no, but you know, I live in San Diego. I've been downtown, I've seen all these people running around in their costumes and stuff. And to me, again, as not really a comic book guy, it was all kind of weird. I remember driving down to San Diego to go to Comic-Con. I'd never gone to Comic-Con before. And the drive from LA to San Diego normally is a two and a half hour drive. It took six hours. Myself and my, my girlfriend at the time, 
were staying at the W Hotel, and Stan Winston was staying at the W Hotel that year as well. I actually gave him a DVD at the hotel. I said, you know, I know you're busy, but you know, watch it when you get a chance or whatever. And I felt good about seeing Stan and getting his blessing and all that. It was gonna show in a little room up above the main floor. It was a small room. It only sat a couple of hundred people. I mean, it wasn't some big venue kind of thing. Then we had these little uh, cards printed up, these little four by five cards that just had the silhouette of Batman. And I think on the, the, the front of it said, Batman Returns for real. Sandy gave us all big stacks of cards and split up and started passing out invitations to come to the screening of Batman Dead End. People had seen some of the photos that were on the back. There was a photo of Andrew as the Joker and this great photo of Clark. I honestly did not know what to expect. I didn't know what was going to happen in the next three or four hours. Clark and myself periodically would go up to this room where the film was playing you know, at 10.30, 11 o'clock. And we'd look in these rooms, and I kid you not, there were like 10 people sitting there. And Clark and I are looking at each other going, man, I, I hope people come to see this movie. I, I literally, I mean, I was worried. I made sure to go early to the room, because I thought there might, might be hard to get a seat. So I sat through a lot of other films waiting for our film. Two o'clock rolls around or whatever the time of screening is and I go up there and I come out of the hallway and there's a line to get in the room and the lights are off in the room. The previous film to Dead End is still playing but there's so many people packed in there now and I remember just feeling so bad for the guy, whoever it was who had made the film, the one that showed before Dead End because he had a packed house in there but they weren't there to see that movie. They were there to see Batman because when that movie was over and the lights came up, nobody moved. So I'm in this little room and Sandy comes in and we were shooting behind the scenes so there's someone with a camera and Sandy's like, dude, you've got to come out here and see what's going on. I walk out of the door and there was a line, no exaggeration, that went as far as you could see. It, it, it was immense. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way everybody's gonna get to see this movie. So with the camera, we went down, we started talking to people. What do you think about this? And this is insane. Like, there's gonna be 600 people out here waiting to see this thing. Look, they're lined up half an hour in advance. This thing's gonna go off. They couldn't wait for what they were about to see, and they had no clue. I was seated there, uh, kind of like the only one in the theater who knew, like, you fanboys. You, you do not. <laughs> know what you're gonna see. I was inside the room with Clark, Simon and Darren, I said we were all in there. Kirk Carley was there. And I can remember the first hit of music it comes on. And then you see the first scene and then the chills start coming up in my body. And I'm just looking around the room like something's about to go down. And the movie starts out, you see Joker and people are like, hey all right Joker and it's like a cool looking Batman. All right, that's kind of cool. And then uh, when the alien shows up and grabs Joker and pulls him out of frame, the audience goes crazy. <laughs> and the brass knuckles fall to the ground, clank, 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 and Batman turns around, there's another alien waiting for him, and the audience goes crazy again. And then there's the close-up of the alien head, and then they freak out when they see the Predator. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. People are going crazy. I'm looking around still not knowing what's going on because I had no clue really what I was involved in at the time. Then it ended. The place went insane, just crazy insane. It's got a standing ovation, people, and they, they want, everyone's yelling, show it again, show it again. So then it was all about all these people that were standing in this line wanted to get in to see the movie. So I remember that at that point, the fire marshal got involved. Now you can only have so many people in this room. And the guy that was running the, the projector, the, the, the DVD player came up to me and says, look, if we can get all these people out of here and get another couple of hundred people in here, we can show it one more time. So Clark, me, Darren, everyone's out there. All right, all right, out, 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 out. We're gonna run it again. <laughs> Bring another group of people in, show it. And then after the second showing, the audience went crazy. There was a time where if you made a short film, you were lucky to show it in a room full of 50 people. At that point, we're all feeling pretty good. You know, a couple hundred people got to see our movie. You know, every, it got like a standing ovation. Everybody was clapping, everybody loved it. 
We thought that was the end of it. We're like, we came, we saw, we conquered, we did what we meant to do. Everyone's just stoked. And all of a sudden, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Walker approaches me. And Jeff is, I believe is the head of programming for the masquerade. For those of you who don't know, the masquerade is the biggest event at the Comic-Con. It's held in this gigantic hall that holds 5,000 people. And it's the costume contest. They have all these giant movie screens everywhere. They show all the trailers for the upcoming movies that year, the superhero movies. This is a big event on Saturday night that everybody goes to. He says, look, uh, I got an idea how we can show this movie to everybody. He says, I'm gonna open the masquerade with it. And we all looked at each other and was like, well, can you do that? He's like, well, yeah, I'm the director of programming. Just get me a DVD. So I remember the line for the masquerade ball was at least four, five, 6,000 people deep. And I was with my buddy, and I was like, we're not getting the back of this line. They're going to open the, the doors in 10 minutes. Let's go around back. We actually snuck in through the back and ended up sitting like third row of this masquerade ball. And by now, the word got out. So it was standing room only. I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm a creative person. You know, to, to embellish things is part of my job description. But no exaggeration, no lie. The lights go down. It comes up. You hear the bass. And I remember the crowd just screaming, exploding. And I, I remember looking at my friend and we're like, whoa, this is interesting. And how did all these people know about this? And then as soon as the, the first dialogue with Batman and Joker comes up, it's Shh. It's like a hush, just quiet. It's over. And everybody's just riveted to the screen. And I can hear people behind me whispering. As the thing goes on, it's getting more and more involved. The alien shows up, Predator shows up. You could feel the intensity in this room. And at the end of the movie, when Clark turns around and pulls out those two batarangs, and the Predators come into frame, and it cuts to black, and it says, written and directed by Sandy Calora, the entire place went fucking nuts. I, I got chills. I looked at my friend, and we're like, who would have thought, like, this is short? was screened in front of this many people, and the roar it got. I mean, of all the other trailers they ended up playing that, that evening, that one had such a huge response. I'm all the way in the back, and literally, there were people standing on their chairs at the end, screaming and yelling. I get up, and I walk off to the bathroom, and I went in the bathroom to pee, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. What we did right now shook up the world. It, it, it just culminated into this gigantic crescendo that was Batman Dead End at the Masquerade at Comic-Con 2003, and it was one of the best nights of my life without question. I mean, I was on cloud nine. You could have knocked me over with a feather. It was pretty tremendous. You know you have a hit on your hands when you show your movie on a Saturday and then on Sunday you go to the dealer's room and it's already for sale as a bootleg on dealer's tables. I guess that's the ultimate form of uh, flattery there is being bootlegged, you know, <laughs> so you're legit at that point. All of the DVD guys would have a stack of Dead End and they did something tricky. They would print a different cover and I'm just like, is this different? And they're like, oh yeah, that's a different one. It's got like extended stuff, and I'm like, oh, I already have that one. And they're like, no, 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 this has got like like 10 minutes of extra stuff. And I bought like a second one, and I'm like, man, that guy fucking lied. This is the same one. But it's good because I used to watch it on my computer. Like, I would just keep it, and then uh, it got stuck in there. So it's good I had a spare. When it hit the internet, and it, people were saying they were going nuts, people were downloading like crazy, we were driving back to LA, and he was getting phone calls. Then Ain't a Cool News picked it up, uh, and Harry Knowles and company were kind enough to do, uh, do a blurb on us. If you're an artist in this day and age, you've got a million people with their arms folded going, impress me, and dead end impress people. And then that's all anybody talked about. I was shocked at, at how it just kept building and building and building, you know, all the way to Howard Stern. He got a tremendous amount of attention. People were drawing cartoons about him Tons of write-ups was on the cover of magazines. It, you know, it was one of the biggest fan films that's ever been made. Kevin Smith was talking about it. This guy was writing it up. The New York Times was calling me. The LA Times was calling me. I, I, my head was spinning. 
It's the honeymoon, right? Everybody's all excited about it. It's the big buzz. I was jealous. I hated him. <laughs> and he could have made it better if he just called me. When he made this film, when it came out cool, a seed was planted in Hollywood to show, A, this can be done if you guys take the time to, to try to figure out how to do it right. And B, there's an audience for it. High-powered producers, directors, everybody wanted to see this magic little eight-minute film. And you're expecting the axe to fall, the other shoes to, to drop. And I think the studios were just like, my lord, that's just good. I bet you they all went, what do we do? I always thought that after Batman Dead End that Sandy was gonna get a deal with Fox or Warner Brothers or Paramount, one of those you know, big production companies. Sandy put his money where his mouth was. He can't ask for better than that. And that was his whole reason in doing it, was to prove that he could do exactly what the fans wanted. After the success of Dead End, and the response was so large, it's like, okay, well now it's gonna happen. You know, I got an agent, I got a manager, and it was a very exciting time. You know, it probably went to his head. You know, it had to. I don't, I, if it happened to me, it'd probably be the same thing. It's hard not to. I've been in that situation where everybody goes, oh my God, that's brilliant, that's great. And you tend to go and get a little bit of a puffed head. So the humility, I think, was his biggest downfall. Sandy has a bit of a reputation. And, you know, he, he's one of those guys, you either love him or you hate him. And, you know, he's rubbed some people the wrong way in the industry. I told him, are you recording this? Yes. OK. <laughs> he's going to get pissed. All right. I, I told him, if we were in that small room where they, they were premiering all the short films, he got up on stage. Like he won the Academy Award. <laughs> The power, you know, the electricity, the moment, he got really egotistical. And it, it, it really showed. It just felt a little bit uncomfortable. I kept saying under my breath, humble, humility. He just wasn't quite there. But I understand the enthusiasm and just the unbridled joy of unveiling that project and seeing the way people reacted. I, I you know, it, it, it was hard to restrain. I said, you act humble. Don't, don't act like, you're not Cameron yet. People tend to relate to somebody that seems more on their level, more one-to-one, -one, more sharing than I'm greater than you, I'm bigger than you. But there was also that little part that said, wow, this is kind of like feeding into his ego. I hope it's not feeding into his ego in a very bad way. I want to show you something. What are you doing over there? All right, watch this. What is this? Oh my God. I can't hear you. I can't fucking hear you. Where did you find this? I shot that. What do you see when you watch that? I see a young guy who didn't know any better, you know? I'm, I'm embarrassed by that footage. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do, lie? I mean, it went to my head. The success of Batman Dead End went to my head a little bit. And it, it fed an, an already pretty healthy ego. And I took some knocks for that, and I, I got knocked back a little bit by that. I had to, you know, regroup and reassess how I was doing things, and, uh, and I'm still doing that, you know? Um, it's a process for me. I guess I kind of made a, a little fool of myself there. A little bit. Yeah, a little, little, little embarrassed by that. I, I have heard from people about Sandy's ego. He's always been very humble around me. And he's always been very gracious, and he's always been just a nice guy. So in, on, in all honesty, I've never experienced that, that ego side that everyone's talking about. So Sandy's super excited about this. And you know, who wouldn't be? And then the honeymoon's over. Batman Dead End premiered um, at the San Diego Comic Con. It was a Saturday. We were having my son's second birthday party on July 25th at my house. And my mom was there. She wasn't feeling too good. 
And my, my younger son, Salvatore, he was being christened the next day. So it was a lot of excitement around our house. We had friends around and- I remember looking at my mom, she didn't look good. She was sitting in, on a couch and my son was in a little bouncer. And she was just holding his hand. And she said, I don't feel good. She said, you know, I, I want to go home. I remember saying to my dad, you know, why don't you just, you know, get her home and, you know, so she's more comfortable. And I get this call, the phone rings, and uh, it's my dad. Who was at Long Beach Memorial Hospital uh, saying that my mom had passed away. She would actually died on the freeway or the car on the way home. She, um, she never made it home. When the time comes with the love of your life, is as, has a terminal illness, then at that moment, our whole lives just changed. And it would never return to what it was again. My dad was just a wreck, like an absolute wreck. You know, I watched movies from when I was a kid and, and you always see scenes where, you know, there's a family gathered around and, you know, they're saying the last goodbyes and it's like this surreal moment. And like, you know, we didn't get any of that. Sandy and Sal have missed them very, very much, especially Sandy, you know, he, he was very, very close with his mother and the constant contact, you know, for advice and, and he misses that. It should be like the best time in the world, you'd think, and all of a sudden it's got this cloud hanging over it. It was just, it was pretty awful. I could tell, like, he just didn't, it was almost like he built this wall. He, I just don't think he wanted to expose that because there was all this really good stuff going on at the time, and, and I think that he wanted to try to focus on that to take his mind off what was going on. And I just saw a different side of him that I don't think a lot of people have the chance to see. That is when I saw the real gentle side and the loving side of Sandy and that's really what made me have a heart for the guy and really know that this is the kind of guy I wanted to be his friend. It was hard for me to stay focused on what was going on because now you know I had to deal with her death, the funeral arrangements, agents calling and managers calling and studios calling and and I'm burying my mother. And Sandy's reaction was to get up, and he was going to fight through it. But that wasn't going to stop him. All right, on the ammo. And that's, that's the thing that I really admired about Sandy in that moment, was that he was going to do it. I mean, it didn't matter that he got punched hard and, it, and things weren't going exactly the way he wanted to. He was just going to take that and turn it into something that he could use. You try to knock him down, and man, he's going to bounce up and, and finish the job. And that's, that's Sandy, you know, he's got that determination. And it's part of the determination that makes the man that he is. A tremendous amount happened to him in the year or two following Batman Dead End. The first thing I said to Sandy was, whatever project comes on your plate, take it. Just do it. Don't make the mistake that I made. Because I had done a film years ago that, that uh, got me a lot of recognition, a lot of notice with the studios. And so a lot of projects came my way. We're talking and meeting with all these people. I ended up not doing those projects. And I think in the long run, in, in hindsight, looking back, I realized that that was a mistake. I went on a lot of meetings and I talked to a lot of people about, you know, doing a feature film. And uh, I was given a lot of scripts. I was, the industry term is considered to direct where I met with the creative people at the studio, I met with the executives, I met with writers, I met with actors. And there were a few films that I was hovering around and being considered to direct. After a few of these meetings, I, I could see right away that I wasn't going to fit into this machine that was the Hollywood studio system. I don't think he listened. <laughs> because, because again, he's passionate about what he wants to do. He's very headstrong about his ideas, and the kind of films he wants to make. He should have 
just bitten the bullet and, and done a studio thing that maybe he didn't like and he could have shown his talent through that, you know? Could have done a crappy sequel to something or other and then people will be like, hey, you know, look what, look what he did, you know? I remember my agent and my manager telling me, well, you do one. You know, do one and show them you can do it. And then, and then they'll give you another one. Or, and then maybe down the road you get to do something you want. And that just, that didn't gel with me. So what, I, I have to make shit and put my name on it to eventually get where I want to be? No, that ain't happening. Sandy was poised, the rocket was ready to take off, and nothing seemed to come of it. The phalanx of situations and meetings and things that you have to go through to eventually get into the director's chair of a studio film is so convoluted and so dense that if you screw up at one of those little junctures along the way, you're out. So I could be doing great until I got up to Executive X and said the wrong thing about Person X or Project X. I, 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 no, it's out. He's a loose cannon. He's a problem. He's this. He's that. When you go into the studio and you talk to them and you're very confident, they always misread that as being uh, an ego. You know, Sandy and I are very different types of people, but we're both artists with a vision. And I think that scares them because half these, like, well, I'm being kind here, half these executives, probably more, don't know a goddamn thing about filmmaking. They don't. They're all about statistics. They're all about, you know, kissing ass to get to where they are. They, you know, these people don't even like movies, you know, half of them that I've met. And they take meetings because they literally have rosters to fill. They have a schedule book and they gotta fill it to show that they're working. Because these guys don't give a flying fuck about you. They're just filling their schedule, that's all it is. Quite frankly, the problem with Sandy is he wants to do a lot of his own stuff. And that's difficult, that's hard, that's hard to do in Hollywood. You really gotta be up there. You have to pay your dues to get to the point to where you call the shots. And I think he wanted to shortcut that a little bit. He'd already stepped off the bridge. I think in Sandy's mind, there was no turning back. Batman Dead End was why we all came to Hollywood to make cool stuff. It wasn't like Sandy was gonna go, all right, well now that I've made one cool thing, I'm gonna go and join the machine and just bow out and just give them the drill, the, you know, the junk they want. No. He had, you know, screwed some of those deals up by being stubborn yet again on not, on passing on projects he probably should have taken when the opportunity was right there in front of him. Were there opportunities? Sure there were. Would those opportunities actually manifest themselves into feature films that I could have directed? I don't know. I never got that phone call at that meeting where the studio executive said to me, you are the director of this picture. And I think that really took, I no, I know for a fact, it really took a toll on him because I could hear it in his voice. Going from that super, super high that we were on at Comic-Con to waiting, having meetings, you know, getting brushed off, then to completely being ignored. Sandy and I were hanging out at his studio and he said, Jordu, do you want to know why I haven't gotten any of the opportunities that I, that I feel I deserve? Do you know why? I said, no, and I didn't know what he was going to say. He said, people don't like me. I, I thought, my God, you know, what, what, you know? To me, he said, People think that I am loud and obnoxious or pushy or I want my own way too much. You know, and, and this, is, this is the truth. You know, they, they don't like me. And I, I was bowled over by that because that, that was like a level of honesty I don't think many people are capable of. Of. Yeah, there might be people out there, even people in my own camp that, oh, what did it get you? What did Batman Dead End get you? And I've never looked at it that way. I've always looked at it in a way of, what did I learn on that movie that I'm gonna take onto the next movie and make it better? Not necessarily what the movie itself as a whole got me. I think there's a big difference there. And to me, it's always been about the work. It's not about all this other bullshit. So, 
Did I get to make Triple X2 or Snakes on a Plane or any of those other movies that I was given the scripts to and considered to direct? Just not my bag. He's also willing to live with the consequences. That's the difference. He's got the, the courage of his convictions. He has a lot of good ideas, he had a lot of good scripts, which he did some sculpture and artwork for. He started really working hard on his next big thing, and it turned out to be The Circle. The Circle is an alien gladiator movie. Picture gladiator with Russell Crowe meets Star Wars. He's got these awesome shaman characters, that aliens with these long faces, and they all have these different nuances to them, the earrings and the, the way their headdresses are done. And, in looking at the, the, the drawings and the designs that he had made for it, those designs were really fresh. The story for The Circle was originally conceived by me. Uh, Nick Reed brought on uh, another writer and very creative guy named Hans Rodianoff. And to make a really long story short, Hans, who was, who was very hot at the time as well, uh, was supposed to write The Circle. He was supposed to write the script, I was supposed to direct and design everything. And I remember thinking, this is really a brilliant project. He's got another he's got another hit in the making. He just needs that one break. Nick Reed, my agent, asked me, if there was one guy in Hollywood, producer, studio exec type, that, that you would like to meet with to talk about a project, who would it be? Without missing a beat, I said the Weinsteins. These are the guys that got behind Quentin Tarantino, that got behind Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, all these guys, independent filmmakers that I looked up to that did great work. And I said, you know, I think, I think Bob Weinstein would get me. You know, I mean, I think he'd really be into what I have going on. He's, oh, I think that's a great choice, great choice. Set up a meeting with Bob Weinstein. And I went crazy. I designed and sculpted so much stuff. I mean, this, this presentation was like a rolling road show. It was 10 or 12 maquettes, it was models, it was everything. I had all these drawings. I kitbashed model parts and made this, in, this incredibly ornate and articulated chair that the villain Lobro sits in. To this day, I've put more work into the circle than anything else I've ever developed, hands down. I go over to, at the time, was Miramax, and they take me up to the conference room, bring all the maquettes up there, all the artwork, everything, set it all up, 20 minute ordeal. In comes a guy who is not Bob Weinstein. You know, I, I don't think that the people that he was talking to were uh, mega, mega high profile people. And you know, you wind up giving the pitch and you know, you're disappointed because you wanted to meet with the man and it's some development person or whatever it is. So we went out and we pitched to the studios and we had tons of meetings. We went all over. And after a few pitches, the three of us, Nick Reed, myself, and Hans got together. And it was right around the holidays. And Nick said, look, he said to Hans, why don't you take the holiday break and write it on spec? And Hans didn't want to do that, so I wrote it. And he's got this really great script. He's got a lot of energy and dynamics in it. He's got a good character. And looking back, you know, you think now it's like what John Carter of Mars tried to be. So at that point, I decided that I was just gonna go out with it as kind of like a one-man show. Like, look, I wrote the script, I wanna direct, I designed all these characters, I sculpted all these maquettes, I've designed this world, and this is the film I wanna make. It came close a few times. I actually had a producer attached that brought a, uh, a very famous actress to the project to play Satana, the, the alien warrior princess. And the only stipulation to that was, I'll never forget this, uh, was that I, I met with this actress, who shall remain nameless, and she says, look, I love the script, I love your passion, this is great, but I don't want to wear that makeup. Satana has to be a human. And I said, but if she's a human, you, you lose the whole gestalt of the story. You lose the whole Star Trek element of it. You know, it's Kirk with the green girl. And she was like, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna put my face under, you know, two inches of rubber. So that was the end of that. So eventually I realized that 
The Circle was not going to be my first feature. It was just too big and the budget was too big. The Circle is still my favorite project till this day and it's something that I'm, I still remain very passionate about that I'd love to get to make someday. And so Bob, if you're watching this documentary, this, give me a call, set up a meeting. I got some cool stuff I want to show you. This business is filled with people who get knocked down and have to get back up. That's, that's part of the business, it's part of the job. It took Sandy a while, but over the years, he's managed to develop that skill. Although we kept pitching and I kept trying, I always knew in my heart that it would have to be a pretty special producer, a pretty special executive, and a pretty special studio that I would have to work with to be able to do what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Once in a very long while, you'll meet somebody who actually knows what they're doing, knows what they're talking about, and can see when someone has talent and is inspired and will want to get behind that person. It's rare. It's so rare in this business. I sat back and said to myself, you know, I wonder if I should just go make an independent movie. Why am I putting my future in the hands of these people? It was a tough five years in between Batman Dead End and Hunter Prey. He said, I'm gonna do this. And I'm gonna do it for this much. It's gonna look like this. He did drawings and storyboards. He went on and raised money and sold his insane toy collection and all this crap to, to finance his own film, Hunter Prey, and do it his way. And that was Ball Z. Ball World War Z. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would take the last of my money and, and just fly without a net like that. He tells me he's got, I don't know, like a quarter million dollar budget or something like that. I have to scale everything back and work within the budgetary constraints that I have. But to me, it's worth doing that to do what I want to do and maintain their creative control that I wouldn't have at a studio at this juncture in my career. It's on an alien planet and he, you know, shot someplace. I know he shot in Mexico and he could have driven out to the desert or Vasquez Rocks or, you know, he could have done the lazy way, but he didn't. He, he went someplace that was gonna serve his, his vision. When I'm on a film, this is my world right here. This is my world. This is all I care about right here, is what's in the frame. Everything outside of here is black. It's periphery. I have to make this. It was a tough time. I do remember getting to Mexico, getting to the house where we shot at. Right on the beach, beautiful. Out the back door was the beach. And every day, we would do a 180 and march out into the fucking desert. And it was like, okay, well, you're gonna wake up at four or whatever in the morning and start makeup. And I was like, well, we're doing makeup. Oh, right here in the kitchen. Okay, where's the lights? Well, <laughs> here's one light. We had one spotlight to do, to do the makeup. Not always good food not always food. Food that I would never eat in a million years, surrounded by, you know, 20 people that I would probably not hang out with in any other circumstance. It was hot, it was miserable. We had no vehicles, so we just humped everything in. Well, halfway through the day, I was thinking, how do I get out of this? It was a, an environment that was absolutely horrible. One girl in there, one bathroom, everybody, you know, dumping in the same toilet, one cold shower. Sandy told me out of his own mouth, he said that the people that helped him with Hunter Prey, the crew, he said, I don't think they'll ever work with me again because I pushed him so hard. And I said, well, Sandy, you know, it's like, I don't have to tell you, you know, the bottom line is your film got done, right? True, yeah. He will stop at nothing to get something done. That's what Jim Cameron would do. That's what Ridley Scott would do. That's what Steven Spielberg would do. I have a very strict and a very intense work ethic. What he was able to do and construct as a story by showing us a little bit of outer space and a little bit of the characters in an environment of technology and then really jump into the, the environment of the, the desert, I thought that was just very well done. And what he puts together looks just top notch. I mean, he's got the special effects with the ship coming out of the, the sand. And 
it's all movie magic, you know? It's like, you know, it's a dumpster with sand and two guys are pulling some plates apart and you're like, oh my God, really? That's, that's how you do that, you know? I just didn't understand how he managed to get this done, especially for the budget and, and, for, the, and for the spectacle of it. I think the story is a good sci-fi story. It's, it just harkens back to good, old-fashioned science fiction. But at the same time, you know, I felt like it was lacking something. It didn't have a movie star connected to it. Clark is great in that film, but is the voice of Aaron Gray. That's your star. Had one of these helmets come off and it had been John Malkovich or, you know, the film would have been all over the place, you know? It would have been huge. And that's the only reason. You know, another thing you don't hear a lot of people talk about is how well Hunter Prey's done internationally. Done incredibly well. In the UK, it was big. In Australia, very popular. Japan ate it up. So it was not a big blockbuster. It didn't get a theatrical release. But he did it. Again, he did it. He made a feature this time, a full-length film. Um, and it drags and has its problems, but he made a feature. Now, here's something where you can say, I have the experience, I've made a feature, and there have been careers built on far less than Hunter Prey. Making independent films is a war of attrition. The entire process from getting financed and shooting and distribution and all that, it's like pushing a giant rock up a hill. And you push it, you push it, you push it, you get it all the way almost to the top, and then it rolls down over you, all the way down to the bottom, and then you have to walk all the way down the hill, get behind the rock again, start push, push, push it back up. And the second time, like, maybe you, know, you don't get as close as you did the first time, and it rolls back over you again, and you gotta walk back down to the bottom of the hill, pick the rock up again, start pushing it back up the hill. Push, 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 push. That's what being an independent filmmaker is like. He's gonna just keep doing it. I mean, that's what he's, that is what he does. He just keeps getting up and going back, and he figures another way. But if you can get that rock to the peak of the mountain and get to make your film and have the creative control, nothing on earth like that. And that's why I keep doing it. The best thing to ever come out of Batman Dead End for me, <laughs> personally, is I'll never forget a buddy of mine's at a toy store and he goes, hey, there's a toy and it's you as the red predator from Batman Dead End. And I was get out of here. He bought it, he brought it to me. There's the toy, seven inches of big red. And that, that was the character I played. Randy Falk at NECA Toys asked me if I would be interested in doing a toy of big red. Initially, we decided to do Big Red um, really just for ourselves because we figured out ah, there's no way we're going to be able to make this as a consumer product because of it being fan film and not sanctioned or licensed and everything like that. And it turned out really cool. And then we just kept looking at it saying, man, fans would love this. And uh, the more I looked at it, the more excited I got about the idea that at that point I had been working with Fox. I sort of approached the topic with them to see uh, you know what the reaction would be and how they felt uh, legally about you know covering something that's sort of in that gray area I got him on the phone and I said what what's this all about and he says well we'd like to know how you feel about us making a, a, a an action figure of, of big red I said I, I feel great about it but the problem is you you got to go to Fox I mean it's it's up to them and he goes well we already went to them and they said that we had to go to you legally. Uh, not required to do that on our side or Fox's side, but um, I think everyone has respect for what Sandy created, and uh, I think initially he was stunned. I, I was really surprised by the whole thing. I was really taken back. And then said, yeah, that, that's great, but um, you know, I'd like to sculpt it, I think was his response, and I was like, well, we kind of already did it. Less than a year later, you know, it's the proof in the pudding right there. Uh, that is a quarter scale, 18 inch articulated, fully licensed action figure of the big red predator from Batman Dead End. For me, that's the, the pinnacle of the success of uh, Batman Dead End. Something as simple as a short that's well made, having that much value 10 years later that someone's even gonna bother making a toy. 
I think that's pretty cool. And I think that's a testament to the film itself and Randy just being a huge fan and having the love and the dedication and the want to do it, to be able to approach Fox. I mean, I think that that took a lot of chutzpah on his part. And, and you know, it was very cool of him to do that. And I think what NECA came up with in the end is, is a really, really incredible, super accurate representation of that character. And I'm, I could not be more thrilled with it. I went and made Hunter Prey. Now I'm going to make Shallow Water. Sandy gave me that script before we even did Hunter Prey. And I've always said to him, I think the, the story, the concept, making a creature suit, I think that's his real, real true passion. So I'm, I have really high hopes for this project being a, a breakthrough original concept. For Shallow Water, I don't know much about the project yet. He did invite me and Shannon Shea over one night to to look at it, and I think it's a cool design. It's certainly interesting. Um, I have not seen a, a turtle-inspired creature in a while. You know, this next one could be the one that, that starts putting the guy on the map. I hope so. Everything that I learned on Hunter Prey, the mistakes that I made on Hunter Prey, are all gonna come to bear here. This movie is much more commercial. It's much more faster paced different genre. This time I'm tackling a horror movie, which is something that I've always wanted to do. It's a very gritty, gory, real horror movie. I know this, it's another passion project of his, you know, and even though I think in looking in hindsight, he really didn't take the road of making those big studio movies. I think, I think in the long run, he'll be much happier doing what he's doing now, which is raising his own money, making these lower budget films, but having full control. Because when you have total autonomy on a project, uh, there's nothing in the world like it. You know, this is me. You know, this, this is me. I'm a pretty happy dude. I mean, you know, I follow both my passions in life vigorously. I mean, I fish and dive a lot, and I write a lot, I draw a lot, I sculpt a lot. You know, I'm always creating. I come out here and take a deep breath and I get invigorated to just keep pushing forward creatively. And that's, that's all you can do is just keep, is just keep moving forward. It's just, it's really hard to do when the waves are good or the fishing's good. Oh, there he is. That's, that's a better fish. Oh yeah, that's a good one. 